This morning, we are going to partake of the Lord's holy table together and uh, because it's the first Sunday of the month. And of course, this month is on the calendar. It's called the month of May, right? <laughs> but it won't be the month of May, may be, may not be. It's going to be the month of hope in Jesus' name. So let the calendar say it's the month of May, but for you and me, it's the month of hope where you're going to see God honoring our hope as we correct our hope. But I want, I, want to, I want to start with hope in the communion, hope in the Lord's table, or if you call it in the traditional way, Eucharist, right? So hope in the Eucharist. What does, what does the Lord's body and his holy blood show us? What's the hope in it? Why is it that Christians are almost like cannibals, as they say? It's, it's a bloody cross. There's so much of blood and body of Jesus involved. How can you eat the body of the Lord Jesus, right? And I want to look at why it is mentioned in the Bible, the way it is mentioned, and what really it is in the Holy Bible. But let's start with this. What is hope? Now, all of us have hope, right? It's, it's really an expectation, it's really a desire. Hope is really a belief in the fulfillment of something you like to have. In the fulfillment, in the happening, in the receiving, in the procurement, in the obtaining what you desire to have. And so in many ways, the opposite, the antonym, the opposite of hope is fear, anxiety, so on and so forth. But there's a difference between hope and faith. <laughs> that is a difference. You will find like uh, uh, words like faith, hope, uh, used in the Bible almost uh, uh, regularly. And, and the Bible talks to us about faith and hope. So what's the difference between the two? See, faith is about God doing something now. Hope is about what God is going to continue to do in the future. Faith is about possessing. Hope is about expecting. <laughs> Faith tells me where God has kept me, but hope shows me where God is taking me. Therefore, faith and hope can never and should never conflict in our lives. Now, many of us have faith and we know God has kept us as his children. But our hope, unfortunately, is that maybe God will drop me halfway. Maybe God's not going to keep me in the next wave. Hey, God who calmed the waves of Galilee in that sea. God who calmed the waves in the lives of the disciples on that boat that was going to sink. I tell you, he's not just a God who can calm the waves of the waters of the sea. He can calm the waves of every pandemic that comes again and again when he rises up in the boat of your family and says, peace be still. It's not just the waters that go calm. It is the pandemic that will go calm. A thousand waves might rage in the oceans of the world, but your boat is going to go safe. Because he that is in the boat walks on those waves and calms them with his mighty power. The hope shouldn't be the waves will get the better of us. The hope should be Christ is going to be manifest. That should be our hope that he is going to work. And you see, when you, when you look at hope and, and, and God... <laughs> When I think of the word hope, I think of wonderful people in our church who have words like, uh, names like hope. You know, we dedicate children with the name hope and have wonderful young people getting married, some with the name hope. And I think those are very hopeful families. But, but uh, the other day we were really, really hurt. Really hurt because uh, two, three weeks ago, we, we had to conduct a few funerals that was devastating. Especially when, uh, you know, when you are a church with a, a huge congregation, ten thousands of people, it's quite normal to have uh, weddings and uh, child dedications and housewarmings and funerals happening back to back because the more the people, the more the activities. But, but something really hit us hard was when we had to do a few funerals, uh, one or two or three, which, which were related to COVID and especially young person. That hit us very hard. 
So as I was studying from the word of God and I was looking to God for consolation and kind of bothered me in one funeral, I couldn't preach. It, it kind of hit me very strong. And I just told the people, I can't preach, I'm sorry. I mean, what do I say for this young life that snuffed out so quick? And we just prayed and conducted the funeral and then the burial. It was painful. The pastors were there to help out. The staff was there, but it was painful. But, but in that, as I was looking to God for answers and, and seeking God, something came within my heart. And it was this. You know, nature will behave as nature should behave. Nature doesn't discriminate between who is righteous and unrighteous, right? The virus does not discriminate between who is right and wrong. The pandemic, the struggle, the problems doesn't discriminate, doesn't, it's not racial, it's not, it's impartial, it's common. So they behave as they should. You know, the waves of the sea will never look at a boat and whether it's a dark-skinned person's boat or a white-skinned person's boat. It doesn't look at a boat and look at whether it's an educated man as the captain or an illiterate as the captain. No, the waves hit every boat on the sea. The waves come against every ship that is sailing. But you know, when these things happen, I felt the Lord telling in my heart, God who put a difference between Israelites and Egyptians in the time that God was visiting Israel to deliver them from Egypt and all the plagues that came on Egypt, not one afflicted Israel. I felt in my spirit that when we pray together, Jesus will rise up in the boat and calm the way for that family, for that boat, for that situation. And I felt excited and I shared this with our pastors and after that funeral, we began to pray together. Every night we would get on the Zoom, pray together for a miracle. For a, and after that, till today, we have not conducted even one funeral out of COVID. And, and you know what? It's not because people were not sick. So many were sick after that. Uh, in fact, doctors gave time saying, you've got few hours to live. And I'm not saying people won't die of COVID anymore. But so many who had the death warrant on them to speak medically came out simply because we realized we need to change our hope. We must understand a child of God's hope must be not in what the pandemic can do, but in what God can do. Now, I'm not saying that uh, if, if you pray, people won't die. Hey, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But where is he? He's not here because he died again. Death is a normal human thing. But you have authority on its timing. You have authority on the way you decide to go. The pandemic doesn't have the last word. Your hope in Christ has the last word. And that is what I'm trying to explain. So, so that's one thing we began to pray. And, and in the church, we see such a big change, a big difference. And, and just a few days ago, I felt the Lord inspiring me to say another thing. And, and I'm saying it right in the beginning of the message because I want you to join me in believing this. And we're going to pray together. And as a pastoral team, we started praying together that in this season, as GDP is falling down like apples from the tree, you know, as, as rain from the sky, as economy all around the world is going down, people becoming jobless, businesses getting shut, lockdowns, and everything else. I felt in my spirit, against these waves, we're going to pray and God is going to prosper his children. I don't know. Maybe God will send ravens with stuff in their beak. I don't know. God's got the most unusual way of doing things. You want to doubt this and lose your job, go ahead. You want to put your hope in Christ and get promoted into something greater, your choice. But today I'm preaching about hope in Christ Jesus. This month is about hope. If you want to be depressed, the time is over. Time out. No more time to be depressed. You're going to be joyful in Christ. Why? Because your journey ahead is great. That's what God told Elijah, who was 
lying down under the bush. An angel brought and gave him bread and water. The guy drank that and went back to sleep. Solid super depression of the highest order. I tell you, he could eat all the tablets in an entire pharmaceutical and wouldn't get better. He was so bad. Angel tapped him and said, eat and drink, you got to go. He looks at the angel and he's so depressed, doesn't even want to take a selfie with an angel. I mean, look at what we missed for a lifetime. And then God says, no, your journey is great. And that's what God is telling you and me today. Our journey is great. Hallelujah. You've got a long way to go and you've got a great thing to accomplish by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our hope must be in Christ Jesus. Our hope shouldn't be in, oh, all the wrong things I've done is going to catch up with me. All the enemies that I have are going to have effect on me. No, your hope should be in God's promises are going to catch up with me. The prayers I made are going to be answered. Why? Because there are two powers that work in the world. One is the power of the evil, negativity, falsehood, blasphemies. And the other is the voice of God and the anointing that is looking for somebody who trusts in him so that he can show himself powerful on their behalf. There are two entities at work. And the question is, with whom will you cooperate? You can't be holding on to God's hand on a Sunday and from Monday holding on to the devil and then hoping for good results. We have to be careful to choose a party. Now I'm not talking about political party. I'm not talking about a weekend party. I'm not even talking about a party you like to put up for yourself. I'm talking about whose side are you on? Are you on the side of God's word and hope? Or are you on the side of unbelief and doubt on what God cannot do, but the enemy might do? Don't you get into that rut. Let our minds be filled with hope in what God can do. Pastor, you're preaching about hope, Pastor. You have hope. You've got a big church. You've you got life going on. But look at me. You don't know my situation. Ha! I wish I could turn the camera on and show you, man. There's nothing here except three camera stands. <laughs> our hope is not in what we see. Our hope is in what we know as God is in charge and Almighty is in power. Hallelujah. And I tell you, my brothers, it's time we take our eyes off what is visible and invisible and put our eyes on Christ Jesus. Isn't that what happened in the camp of Israel? This is all introduction. Some of you wrote saying you want long message. You got it today. At least, even if it's not a long message, you got a long introduction. You know, the camp of Israel, fiery serpents began to come, Numbers 21, and bite people to death. For whatever reason, that's a different story. People are dying. Moses cries out to God, God, pandemic, this is serpent pandemic. What do I do? God says, raise up a brazen snake, a snake made up of brass. Lift it up so people can see that. Now in the New Testament, Jesus, our Lord, came and said, I am going to be lifted up. Like that brazen serpent lifted up by Moses. I'm, I'm, I'm a shadow in that brazen serpent and a reality on the cross. That brazen serpent was a reflection of who I am. Jesus said that. Because when I take on the sin of the world, I will look as ugly as that serpent that was lifted up. When the world's sin comes on me in the eyes of God, I'll be as dirty as that ugly serpent was in the eyes of people. And Moses said, tell everyone, look at that brazen serpent. I want to ask you a question. When snakes are running through your house <laughs> and some are biting you, where you have the mind to go out and look at that brazen serpent? Huh? I'm sure there were a lot of theologians who came out of Bible college those days saying, hey, all these faith people have no sense. Hmm? Is this the time to look at that brazen serpent? There are snakes all over. Run around, try to save yourself, tie a bandage. <laughs> but the Bible says those who looked, those who looked, those who looked to what God had commanded were healed and they lived. Hope is not in running away from the trouble. You need to run away from trouble. That's of course true. But hope is to run looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's where healings happen. 
Hallelujah. Guess what happened? When all began to look at that brazen serpent that was lifted up in the New Testament, that's Christ Jesus. What happened? They forgot that they are from 12 different tribes. Otherwise, these guys had civil wars between the tribes. They forgot about who is rich and who is poor. They forgot about their differences. They forgot about marital issues and they forgot about father-child problems. They all had unity in faith as they looked towards the cross. And that's where healing began to flow. And I want to tell you, hope comes only through Christ Jesus. There is a power that is at work for destruction. Pastor, when will this whole problem end? I will tell you at the end of the message when this will end. Okay? No, I'll tell you now only. This will end when it has to end. I'll say that again. This will end when it has to end. For you, it will end today in Jesus' name. It will end now in Jesus' name for you. That doesn't mean that you uh, behave like you're not on water. No, you better be in the ship. God is going to protect you, Noah. Even though the whole world is going to be flooded to death, God's going to protect you. Now, don't just get out of the boat saying, ah, I am under God's protection. You will sink to death. Stay where God wants you to stay. Remain where God wants you to remain. Keep what God wants you to keep. But for you, there is no flood. For you, there is no destruction. Why? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Hallelujah. Amen. Two powers at work. Now, why did Jesus come? Let's start with the first scripture. John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief only comes to, he comes in order. I like that paraphrase, order. Thief also has an order. <laughs> the thief only in order. He comes in order. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. See, that's the order he comes in. He comes to steal your time, steal your hope, steal your faith. And when you lose those things, his next agenda is to kill it. Maybe to kill you, kill relationships, kill your time, kill your talents. And then to destroy the entire purpose of God in your life. Because sometimes when he kills your time or he kills your ability or he kills your attitude, a good attitude, he puts that to death. So he will use what he killed to destroy you completely. That's what he does. But Jesus said, I have come. Hallelujah. I have come that they may have and enjoy. I want you to read that. Come on, let's read it together. I have come that they may have and enjoy. Not God just doesn't want you to have a, you know, a rickety, dragging, ragtag life. No, he wants you to enjoy life. Amen. Pastor, shopping mall is shut. How are we going to enjoy? <laughs> God wants to show you that there is a greater enjoyment other than shopping. Whether it's window shopping or real shopping, there is great. Oh, Amazon, Pastor, no. There is something about living a life with Christ Jesus. There's something about that, that you will have life and enjoy life. Pastor, what are you saying? Yes. You're going to enjoy life and you're going to have it in such abundance to the full till it overflows. You know what it means when it overflows? Overflow means you're going to serve others with what God is doing in your life. Overflow is like a river. Hallelujah. Overflow doesn't mean like water tank got overflowing and it all got spilled out on the terrace and went into the water harvesting or the nala. No, that's not what it is. Overflowing means serving others. Overflowing means giving out because you already have more than what you can handle and it's flowing into others' lives. This is what God wants us to have. That's the kind of life God wants you to have. And that's the hope we must have. A hope of serving. Now many people ask, you know, when you talk about Holy Communion, today my, my message is all about uh, Holy Communion and the hope in it. Eucharist and the hope in it. Many people ask questions like, if, if Jesus died on the cross, how does it give hope to us? Didn't he die? Answer is, he died for a purpose. 
It is the law of physics. It is the law of God's nature. When God himself, Jesus, who created the heavens and the earth, put this law in place that unless one form dies, it cannot give birth to another form. That's why uh, farmers, when they sow the seed, you know, they put it one inch under the ground. They bury it. Why? Because the seed will die to give a greater plant, a greater harvest, a greater shrub, a greater crop. The sun that shines so bright, every moment they say, it is burning out about 40 million tons of chemical substance and matter. It's burning itself out. That's why the scientists say, after a few years, few years in there, mean that few millions of years that the sun is going to be uh, nothing it's going to be burnt out yeah you know you and i are living in the times where sun is shining it's his time but then fellow is going to get burnt out because he's burning himself unless he burns himself he cannot give out the heat and the light and the energy and the magnetic electromagnetic spectrum why because one form has to die to give birth to another form. That's basic law of physics. One has to die. One form of energy has to die. What does the petrol do inside our uh, a vehicle engine? What does, it, what does diesel do inside our vehicle engine? That fuel gets burnt out to be converted into energy that drives the vehicle. One form has, that's why no matter how much petrol you pour into your motorbike, it still keeps drinking more depending on how much you drive. The Bible says Jesus died as the seed which is human so that he would be resurrected as a seed that is spiritual. In Jesus, Adam died and in Jesus, the son of God was risen. In Jesus, the curse of Adam died. In Jesus, the sickness in Adam died. In Jesus, the power of sin in Adam died. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, the power of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Death, sin and law were put to burial in the body of Jesus. Righteousness, grace and the anointing of a new life was risen in Jesus. Hallelujah. When you touch the communion, you're touching the hope of a life in abundance, not with the Jesus who died. Because in that, Adam's curse died, but with the Jesus who rose again. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans and in the book of Corinthians, now therefore, since we are risen with Jesus, let's live in the new life. In Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. While you're listening to my message and you're playing on the mobile, life won't work. You believe in God's word with full attention. Amen. The other day someone told me, Pastor, lying in the hospital bed, I was able to concentrate on your message and I got healed. Brothers, concentrate before you go to hospital and live a healthy life by the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ died. Pastor, now we're going to have communion, but does Jesus understand what I'm going through? See, Jesus is not some distant almighty power waiting there and watching saying, aha, see, I told you. No. How, how does Jesus react? You'll find a classic example in John chapter 11. You know, his friend Thomas, the big doubter, had already said Jesus was making a mistake. When you read that passage, because Lazarus was sick and the Lord Jesus was leaving the place and he went away with his disciples. And then the Lord Jesus comes back to Bethany and guess what? Lazarus is dead and buried for four days. He's already dead, burial over. Four days later, Jesus comes. That's like super late. You know, you pray, Jesus come and heal. He was nowhere. Finished the burial, finished memorial service, finished everything. And now Jesus comes saying, hey Lazarus, rang the calling bell. Instead of Lazarus, it was his sisters who opened the door. Jesus, you're four days late. Jesus says, it's okay, show me where you have buried him. 
So they take him to the tomb where Jesus was buried. Now he's going to the graveyard. Jesus is going to the graveyard. Mm. As they are going. See, the thing about the Bible is there are graveyard stories in the Bible. But the thing is, wherever Jesus goes, no? Graveyard or funeral service or a hospital or Bethsaida. Wherever Jesus goes, there is no hope of remaining the same. There is the only hope of changing forever. The Bible says Jesus went there. And guess what? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. John 11, 35. Jesus, I remember it so much because once my mom told me, unless you by heart one scripture, I won't give you dinner. That time my professional consultant was my elder brother. I asked him which one to learn. He said, try John 11, 35. I thought it will be the longest scripture. When I looked at it, says, Jesus wept. I by hearted it in no time, went back and said, I need the dinner. She said, tell me a scripture. I said, John 11, 35, Jesus wept. That night I also wept, but anyway, because my mom, you know, caught me and my brother and punished us saying, don't get away from the Bible like that. Learn at least one scripture decently. And then there was a repetition of the judgment when my dad came home. That's, that's like an average Pentecostal family. You know, yep. <laughs> but I thank God for them. Jesus wept, stood there and wept. Why did Jesus cry? Hey, in a few minutes from now, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But why did he weep? Because when he saw the pain of people, he didn't come there saying, guys, you have no faith. Don't cry now. Is this how you behave? Don't you know I am life and resurrection and I am here? No, Jesus didn't throw a tantrum at their unbelief. Jesus understood their emotions and wept with them. And a few minutes later, he raised Lazarus back from the grave to life and had meal with him more than once. You know what? That's the Jesus you and I have. Not an insensitive, distant, almighty, sitting far away looking at us as some dispensable slaves, whether they are there or no, it doesn't matter. That is a God of another book. The God of the Bible is a God who cares for us. A God who loves us, who feels for us, provided we put our hope in God. Let's put our hope as we partake of the Lord's table in what God can do. Adam and his sin brought sin and death into us. But righteousness came through Jesus. Trust God and the covenant of his blood for a physical recovery. Trust him for a financial recovery. Trust him. Oh, pastor, you know, I lost a lot of money in the hospital. Trust God. In the coming days, you're going to do well and you will make more money than what you lost. God is able. That covenant of grace is on his children. Let's read John chapter 6. Let's read that verse 55 and 56. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The Bible is saying his body and his blood... You see, you and I are connected to Adam's nature through Adamic genetics. But you and I are connected to Jesus through his body and his blood. That's why Holy Communion, Eucharist is important. You're connected to him through his body and through his blood, through the power of his Holy Spirit. The Bible says every time you partake of the Lord's table, understand what it is. Understand its importance. Understand how God works in your life. Amen. Get your hope in what God can do. It's a simple but very profound word of God for us. This month, put our hope in what God can do. We got to be careful of what the devil can do. No doubt. We got to be careful of what evil can do and what foolish choices can do. But our hope should be in what God is going to do, is able to do and will do because he's a promise keeping God. Pastor, you are an optimist. Well, maybe and maybe not. Because there is enough pessimism in me, especially when I look around. When I look at the media, when I read the morning newspaper, ah, who feels good? Nobody. Nobody feels good. It's all doom and gloom. But when I read the Bible, hallelujah, 
He, you know, today's newspaper, today's media is, is, I tell you, if you walk on water, they will write, it's because you can't swim. That's the kind of people. Negativity sells in today's world. Instead of saying, oh, this man is like Jesus, he walked on water, they'll say, actually, he can't swim. There's so much negativity in town. That's why Jesus never bothered about what media said. <laughs> Jesus asked his disciples, what do you say? What do others say? He never asked, what are journalists writing? Good journalists from our church are wonderful. Other fellows I'm talking about. You know, the Bible says, don't get your eyes on those things. Well, you need to read news because you need to be aware of where you live. But your hope should be in the scripture on what God can do. And I want to leave you with a promise before we touch the Lord's table. And I love this promise of God's word. It's Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Let's read it together. And we know that in all things God is working. I have to go bit. Okay, first we'll read the whole thing. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. Now let's just break it down and get it into that microscopic scriptural lab to understand it. And we know, and we know. Let me ask you, what do you know? You know what you read in the newspaper. You know what you watched on the TV. You know what you were surfing. You know about neighbor's gossip. What do you know about God? What do you know about God's plan? For those who know God's plan for your life, we know that it's not just a pandemic working. It is not just a problem working. It is not just a negative working. We know there is someone else working. God Almighty is at work. The last time I read the Bible when he worked in Genesis 1, heavens and earth were created. Man, when God works, there is something that will happen. Hallelujah. When God works, there is something constructive. And we know that in all things, God is working. In all things. Pastor, my family member is sick. In it, God is working. Pastor, my exams are postponed. In it, God, he didn't postpone the exam. But he's, God is working in a certain way. And I'll show you how. Pastor, I'm going to do my interview. God is working in it, brother. Pastor, my marriage got postponed. God is working in it. In whatever God is working. And we know in all things. Come on, wherever you are sitting, say all things. In all things. Who is working? That prophet will close his eyes and say, I see darkness and devil working. Tell him to open his eyes, switch on the light. I didn't mean electric light, scripture light. In all things, God is working. Devil is working. Of course, he's not like some sleeping Pentecostal. He works, he's a hard worker. That's how he got cursed anyway. You need to learn to rest in Christ. And I'm not talking about lethargy. I'm talking about depending on God's word, putting hope in God. But God is working in all things. Amen. Amen. God is working. You know why I get excited when I preach? Because I know in the weakness of my preaching, there is a God's perfection that is working. God is working. In all things, God is working. And for what is God working? While the devil works to destruction, God is working for good. Hallelujah. God is working for good. My brother, when God finishes sister, when God finishes working in your life, you know what it's going to be called? It's going to be called good by God, which means the world is going to look at it like a rainbow. It's going to look at it like a shining star and say, man, who worked on you? And you will know it is the fingerprint of of God working on your life. Hallelujah. In all things, God is working. For what? For good. He's working for your good. I have a request for you and me. Please don't join with the devil in unbelief. Join with Jesus in hope and work with him. When we were building this church, you know the wall behind me? One day some fellows came and broke it down. <laughs> Imagine as a pastor, if I joined those fellows, huh? What a, what a fool I'd be. But I joined with the construction mason. And I said, let's rebuild it. That's why we had this wall rebuilt. I joined the builder. I didn't join the breaking down. In fact, I went to the 
concerned competent authorities reported the matter and got those fellows not to come back here to break down any wall again. Yes, we face challenges, but I didn't join those who break down the church. I joined those who build the church. Your life, God is building. Don't join the negativity and hopelessness and evil of the devil that is breaking you down in unbelief, in doubt, in questioning. I have a doubt in the Bible, I can't believe. Fellow, you doubt devil. This is not the time to doubt God's word. God who created you is saying something, believe in it. How can God create everything? I know sometimes when people ask such questions, I wonder, did really God create this fellow? But anyway, we shouldn't use our freedom to our destruction. Asking questions is not wrong, but ask questions to grow in faith, not to destroy faith. Ask yourself, am I going to join with Jesus who is building my life? Or am I going to join with negativity that wants to break down my life? Where will you put your hope? As you touch the Eucharist, the Bible says, examine yourself. Ask yourself, where am I putting my hope? Am I putting my hope in what Christ did on the cross? For we know in all things, God works together for good. For them that love him. Close your eyes, let's pray together. And say, God, my hope is going to be in you. My desire is going to be in you. I'm going to start liking. I'm going to start expecting. I'm going to start hoping in what you are able to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Cleanse me, Father, as I'm going to eat of your body and drink of your blood. Let this month be a month of unusual success. A month of unusual grace. To purify. To become more holy. To be more focused on your great plan for my life. And should sickness come, should curse come, should some kind of struggle come. I don't want to hope in what that can do. I want to hope in what you can do. I want to take steps to get healthy. I want to take medical attention to get well. I want to pay attention to spiritual scripture. So I can go forward, not in curses, but in blessings. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your anointing. Hallelujah. Let the word of God ingest in your life. Make a promise. Lord, I will not put my hope in what the situation can accomplish. I'll put my hope in what you are doing, even in the situation. Maybe there's an EMI and I don't have the money to pay the bank. Maybe there is this kind of a rough situation in the relationship and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. But God, I'm not going to believe in the power of its negativity. I'm going to believe and hope in what you are doing in and through it all. Maybe someone left and died and is gone away forever. But I believe even in that, you are working. And you're able to take me forward. My life is not over. You're able to take me forward. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we speak your blessings on this bread and wine, symbolic, your body and your blood. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you went to the cross. You died on the cross. You rose again from the dead. And you took us out of Adam's curse of sin and death and put us into life of grace and abundance in Christ Jesus. Thank you as we prepare to eat and drink of your body and blood. May your sanctifying Holy Spirit cleanse us by your precious blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's eat of his body and drink of his blood together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. 
Thank you, Lord, for the covenant of your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that in this service, in this worship session, in this preaching of your word, in this participation of the Eucharist, in this giving to you financially of our tithes and offerings, thank you that in all of this, you are working. You are working. You are working. And we trust you, Master. We trust you, Lord, that you are not just able to heal us, but you're able to lead us in prosperity, in the greatness of your plan. We love you, Master. We worship you today. We thank you. Thank you for blessing the communion service for us. It's our desire, Lord, that soon we'll be able to regather in the church, healthy, worshiping you. But however long it might take, help us to grow closer to you. In Jesus' most holy and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we pray and